Next on KQED Newsroom, more than 200 flu deaths in California and counting. Just try to keep your arm nice and relaxed for me. Why is this year's outbreak worse than others? San Jose State University grapples with race-related harassment. The search for solutions now underway. And one San Francisco doctor's experience treating kids coping with the stress of urban life. Folks who are exposed to adversity in childhood have increased risk of chronic disease in adulthood. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. The number of deaths related to the flu continues to rise. Today, California's Department of Public Health announced 202 people have died and 41 more cases are under investigation. Why is the current flu strain more potent than last season? Joining me to discuss the broader public health picture are Lisa Alaferis, editor of KQED State of Health blog, and Dr. Erica Pond, Director of Communicable Disease Control and Prevention for Alameda County. Before we get into the discussion, Scott Schaefer went to visit a nearby vaccination clinic. Here's his report. Since September, the Adult Immunization and Travel Clinic in San Francisco has been encouraging people to drop in for a visit. Irene? Hi, Irene. How are you doing? Even if it may sting a little. You ready, Irene? Yep. Okay. Just have a little, little pinch, okay? About 40 percent of Californians get vaccinated during the flu season, which runs from October through March in the U.S. This year, even young adults are at risk for severe infection from the flu. In fact, 202 Californians under the age of 65 have already died from H1N1. That's the main flu virus circulating this season. When H1N1 first appeared in 2009, it infected up to 80 million people around the world. So I headed to the San Francisco Department of Public Health to talk with Dr. Cora Hoover about H1N1 and why getting vaccinated makes good sense, even if you're young and healthy. So we've been hearing a lot about H1N1. What is it? One of the things that's unique about H1N1 is that it is known to cause more serious disease uh, in young and middle-aged adults as compared with uh, some of the other seasonal flu strains. Do you know why that is? Uh, I don't think the reasons are well understood. Brian. Hi, Brian. Fortunately, the flu vaccine currently being administered has proven effective against H1N1. This potent flu bug was a big motivator for 33-year-old Corey Pershing. Have a seat. You're here for a flu shot today? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. And what I've heard about the before. H1N1 swine flu uh, is mainly, you know, people have been dying from it. Um, and it's scary to think about with two small kids. Okay. Okay. Thank great. you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. That's really one of the things about flu is that it's very unpredictable. And that's one of the reasons why we recommend a flu vaccine for everyone is that you never know if you're going to be the one that may end up with more serious disease. So we just heard that H1N1 is the main strain circulating this year. Is it more virulent than other strains, Dr. Pond? So H1N1 is a novel strain that we saw starting in 2009, and it does impact different age groups differently. Typically, in a seasonal flu season, we see most of the deaths and most of the impact in the over 65, whereas with H1N1, we actually see potentially some level of protection uh, in people over 65 who don't seem to get the serious disease. So we Why are seeing... That? Um, there are a lot of theories out there. Some, one of the main theories is that perhaps there was a similar strain circulating many decades ago that people over 65 have some immunity and are protected, but people don't know for sure. Okay. And, and the people who are dying, um, are, are they people with underlying health conditions or are you seeing perfectly healthy people of all ages? Um, dying from the flu as well. So the, the, on the call this morning with the state, they said that 90% of the people who had died had some underlying medical condition, but this leaves, I mean, 10% of 202 would be 20 people who had no apparent health condition and still passed away. Right, so every year healthy people can die from the flu. They've done some, a recent summary of all the pediatric deaths between 
um, several years of flu seasons, and they looked at about 800 kids who had died from the flu, and I think about almost 40% of them had no other underlying medical condition. Mm -hmm. So healthy kids can die of the flu every season as well. Um, so many people are concerned about this. It seems like everyone has uh, either had the flu themselves or know someone who has. In fact, it, it hit home for me very personally because a friend of mine, uh, her husband died recently from the flu and his service is tomorrow. So uh, lots of concern. How, how accurate are the statistics on deaths from the flu? Is it reported for everybody in every age category or only certain people? Right, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think there has been some confusion, especially this year. So the only deaths that are legally reportable to public health departments are people uh, less than 65 years of age. And that's only been legally reportable since 2011 as a result of the pandemic in 2009. Oh, that's so we, when a state law came into place exactly, requiring reporting. Exactly. I, I think that's what's right. also interesting is that California is apparently the only state that requires tracking of every flu death. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, requires reporting of children under the age of 18, but it does not, I mean, we spoke to the CDC this week, and they do not require that any state reports all deaths. Why is and, that? And even then, it's probably underreported huh. because some people don't seek medical care, some people don't get tested. Flu is a very common disease. We do try to, the CDC does try to do national surveillance and some estimates nationwide, but they're still very wide. Uh, large estimates of I, hospitalizations I, and deaths. I would say that until the pandemic in 2009, 2010, there was that revved up public interest mm -hmm. in in the in influenza and concern about pandemics. That that would be my right. And looking for new epidemiology, meaning different age groups that are impacted by the flu. In the 1918 sort of the Spanish flu epidemic, it was also mostly younger people that were yeah. impacted as well. And so looking for novel strains or new new patterns of disease was the other reason it was made reportable. Oh. And, and the number 65. of deaths in 1918, astronomical, 675,000 deaths back then. Uh, the current vaccine, how effective is it? Because I know that every year scientists have to sort of predict a little bit in advance which strain will be the main one in any given year because they have to put it into the vaccines months before the flu season starts. Sure, yeah. So every year in the past, we've had at least two influenza A strains and one influenza B strain in the vaccine. And this year, there's a few There's a few different ones. There's a few that actually have two influenza A and two influenza B strains. And since 2009, we've had this particular H1N1 strain in the vaccine every season. And it is a good match this year. Even the uh, other couple viruses that um, have been typed are a good match as well. So people, people worry a lot about the vaccine, but I mean, the, the safety profile is really quite good on the vaccine. And um, I think the estimates they gave today on the call were about that children tend to be vaccinated and elderly tend to be vaccinated, but adults, that's about a 40% vaccination rate. So. And people keep on wondering, uh, I, I hear this question from people all the time, can you get sick from getting the flu vaccine? And is it too late to get vaccinated, Lisa? So I, the, the, they're, they've been really sounding the drumbeat week after week on the call is urging people to please get vaccinated and know the, the flu vaccine for, for the shot is a deadened vaccine, is a deadened virus. So it, um, your body creates an immunity to it, but it, there's, it cannot make you sick. It can give you a sore arm. It can give you a low fever for the next day or two. That's uncommon. Um, it cannot give you the flu, and what was the other half of your question? I'm sorry. Oh, so. well, well, you kind of answered in the beginning, uh, whether um, it's too late to get the flu vaccine, and, even at this stage. And they, so we appear to have, be, have crossed the peak at this point, they said on the call today, and, but there, there is some concern that it could rev back up again. And even, even if we have crossed a peak, that doesn't mean that we're going down to zero cases. So right. they're There's still encouraging, yeah. they're still encouraging people to get vaccinated if they have not been and no, it's not too late, yeah. they say. Are there certain warning signs? Is there any way to know whether it's a flu that you suffer from for two weeks and will make you feel bad versus a flu that can kill you? What should you watch out for? I think the main important things for people to keep in mind as far as when to seek medical care are if they have a high prolonged fever for several days and or they're feeling very systemically ill, just really, really, you know, so tired that they or any mental status changes or dehydration or other um, things that could be concerning, especially in people who have other underlying medical problems, they should at a minimum call their health care provider or perhaps seek care. But it is hard to tell early on whether you just have a cold virus or um, a mild flu infection or other respiratory virus. 
viruses. There's a lot of other respiratory viruses that circulate every year as well. Well, aside from vaccines, Lisa, what are some of the best ways you can prevent catching the flu? So the best one is it's really boring, but wash your hands. That's always the best, and that'll protect you also from everything else that's circulating too. So, but in addition, there are some people who cannot be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so for those people, the um, state health officials were recommending that everyone in a household be vaccinated. So especially um, babies under six months of age cannot be vaccinated. So if you're the, if you're in a family with a little baby or you are a caregiver for mm -hmm. a baby, you should be vaccinated. And the vaccine is readily available. And um, we, I have a link in a post that I wrote today to, it's very easy to find a map, just um, and enter your zip code yeah. and find out where the vaccine is. And remember is. And we, that there's intranasal vaccine as well. That's so right. So two to 49 year olds who are yeah. otherwise healthy can get it. If you're afraid of needles, but you wanna get the flu vaccine, it's also it's, extremely safe. I get it every year. My children get it every year. It's an option, and definitely. It's an option, yes. All right, thank you both, Dr. Erica Pond and Lisa Alaferis. And coming up, helping children deal with toxic stress induced by poverty. But first, the harassment of an African-American student at San Jose State University last fall has prompted much soul searching on campus. Earlier this week, an independent investigator released his report. He found the university responded appropriately once it learned four white students had reportedly tormented the black student, including calling him racist names and fastening a bike lock around his neck. And last night, a task force on racial discrimination formed in response to the incidents held its first public meeting. The group's chair, retired Judge LaDoris Cordell, joined us earlier to discuss what they hope to accomplish. Judge Cordell, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just first of all, so we can better understand what happened here, tell me some of the instances, the incidents that happened to this black student? Well, we know from the fact finders report that there were a series of incidents that occurred in a suite in one of the dorms, and it was a theme dorm where engineering students were. Uh, so there were, by my count, at least 13, maybe 14 different incidents. So they ranged everything from giving this student a nickname that was uh, racially derogatory, uh, that the name was three-fifths, referring to the um, uh, the government sanctioned um, rule in this country. This is during um, you know the slavery, slave right? right? So that every person uh, who's a slave gets counted as three fifths of a vote of a person. So that was for plantation owners, um, so that they could have more votes, right? Uh, so there was the race-based nicknames, and then they would uh, lock him in a room mm -hmm. and take the handle off inside the door so he couldn't get out. Uh, and then the one everyone has heard about, I think, was putting a bike lock, a metal kind of U-shaped shaped bike lock and locking it around his neck and there were two instances where that occurred or at least one in which it was attempted uh, taking his shoes and hiding them uh, putting a confederate flag up first in the window so that those outside could see it and then moving it to have it in the common area in the suite uh, having a swastika uh, Nazi references up um, writing a racial slur on the whiteboard that was in the room so those are the kinds of things so all in all by my count 13 incidents over a matter of weeks about five weeks um, why did no one come forward to report this? Well, we don't know. I mean, the fact finder didn't have the opportunity to talk to the victim, but uh, it's clear the victim did not come forward and say anything, and we don't know why. There can be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and there were students who knew and because this victim told them, but he asked them to not say anything. And I find that problematic that they didn't say anything because their silence led to this, this abuse continuing. So that's, um, that's a concern about, well, what's, what's the thinking? What's the mentality? Um, what, what's, what are, what's the moral obligation that students have. So once uh, the school did find out, and they found out because his parents entered his dorm room and saw the Confederate flag and said, what's going on here? And that's when it all became public. This week, uh, a fact finder came out with his independent investigations findings, basically saying the university acted swiftly and properly um, in that they did everything from moving the harassment suspects away from the student and then eventually suspended them. What do you think of the school's response, and what is your task force going to do now as a result of that? Well, the school's response, uh, I, I've got kind of two different observations on it. One observation is that, uh, as consistent with what the fact finder found, there are rules and policies that the fact finder find, found did not 
They were not broken. They were adhered to by the university. And that kind of, for me, begs the question, if all the rules were adhered to, and this still went on for this long, there's something wrong. There's a problem. The task force, which I chair, the purpose is to look at this fact-finding report and then to see what recommendations there ought to be made to the university to implement to see that this never happens again and what lessons we can learn from this. So you will be looking at well, why is it that this student didn't feel there was someone or a group that he could come forward and talk to? What else will you be looking at? We'll be looking at what's the training of those who lived on the floor, the resident advisors who are really students who work as quasi-staff and those who supervise the resident advisors. Where were they in all of this? When that Confederate flag was up in the window and they were told to take it down and they did, and there were no further inquiries. Well, is, is that problematic? Uh, it turns out from a fact finder's report, many, many times individuals from staff had to go to that suite to deal with issues. But yet the red mm. flags, they're waving, but it didn't seem to really generate the kind of response it should have. So we're going to be looking at those, the training uh, for, for the, those who work in residential life. We're going to be looking at freshman orientation. These were freshmen. Uh, so they, they, they didn't have a long time uh, to be at the school before all this jumped off. So what, what's the orientation? Do they really talk about issues about race and about uh, appropriate behavior? You had your first uh, public meeting this week. You will have public meetings every two weeks until April until when you have your report. Right. And tweet, what, what I, I think is so unique about this process is that th there's a lot of soul searching going on as evidenced by the first meeting that we had. People really talked about the concerns they mm -hmm. have. And what's unique about this is that this is in a public forum. Nothing's being hidden. This is as transparent as it gets. And it's my hope that what we're doing will serve as a model for all of the universities within the California state system. This, in my view, is the proper way to do this. And the president of the university, top staff, um, were administrative staff, were absolutely supportive and are of having this be a very transparent and public process. Because that, as a result of that, you generate trust in the sure. process yeah. and trust in the recommendations. You're obviously very passionate. Judge Cordell, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. And thank you for inviting me. When children are regularly exposed to the stress of poverty, violence, and substance abuse, it can have a lasting impact on their mental and physical health. It can lead to physiological changes and illness, even taking years off their lives. The Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco's Bayview Hunters Point is working to counteract the effects of this so-called toxic stress. Scott Schaefer spoke earlier with the center's co-founder, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. Dr. Burke-Harris, welcome. Thank you, thank you. You work with kids who are repeatedly exposed to what you call toxic stress. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what the kids you work with in places like Bayview Hunters Point, Viz Valley, and neighborhoods like that, what some kids who live in those places go through. What's it like, what's life like? Um, sure, what we see is um, many kids who are exposed to um, things like certainly a lot of community violence, but also um, kids who are growing up in families where there's a parent with mental illness or perhaps substance dependence, and um, uh, some of the challenges that they see in terms of just dealing with some, you know, household dysfunction. There's a lot of um, families where um, one parent isn't at home, or uh, maybe a parent is incarcerated, and so these are the challenges that we see. And what's interesting, and what you've discovered, and what others have discovered, and you're building on, is the idea that this affects them not just psychologically, but physiologically. Talk about the physiological changes that happen. That's exactly right. When kids are exposed to chronic stress, and particularly if it's the traumatic stress like I just described, um, it activates the, the stress response system, what we call the fight or flight system. And that um, uh, releases hormones and chemicals like adrenaline and cortisol. And uh, what we now understand is that kids who we previously thought had you know, problems with attention like ADHD, actually 
uh, what we're seeing is the impacts of um, these stress hormones that are in their body. And is it a change on their, their brains, their nervous systems, all, all of that? So it's actually all of those things. And um, younger children are more susceptible because their brains are growing, uh, are more immature and they're growing quite quickly. Um, but we see changes in uh, brain structure and function, what we call brain architecture, as well as changes to the hormonal systems in the body, and believe it or not, changes to the immune system as well. So they're at higher risk for diseases like asthma and um, of having worse asthma, and also for higher risk for diseases in adulthood like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and heart disease, which is the number one killer in the United States. So what you're saying is that an exposure to these kinds of stresses at a younger age can take years off a person's life when they grow up as well. Absolutely. There have been some major research studies that have shown that folks who are exposed to adversity in childhood have increased risk of chronic disease in adulthood. And in fact, those um, in the major study that was done between Kaiser and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, those people who were exposed to six or more of these adverse childhood experiences had a 20-year difference in life expectancy. Wow. What you're describing sounds a little bit like post-traumatic stress disorder, which we hear about in, say, veterans coming mm -hmm. back from Iraq and mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Two questions, is that what we're talking about in these young people? Mm -hmm. And is it as hard to reverse in kids and teens and young adults as it is in veterans? Um, I would say it's a little bit, uh, what we're talking about is different from post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the reasons why is because when a child is exposed to a traumatic experience, their brains and bodies are still developing. And so that trauma actually has a developmental impact because it affects the way that the brain will go on to develop. So it's not just a, a static um, problem, if that makes any sense. And so the good thing about that, and this is the promise and the hope, is that um, when we intervene early with kids, we have all of that brain development on our side in terms of the ability to uh, do healing work. So what do you do then when a, an infant or a young person, a, a, a two-year-old, three-year-old comes into yes. the clinic, what do you do knowing all of that? What do you do? Well, there are a couple of um, basic things that we do. Number one, we have a home visiting program. So it starts with really going in and um, looking at the child's environment, finding ways to support the parents. This is two generation work. When it comes to healing the effects of toxic stress, you have to work with the caregiver to be able to support them, as well as working with the child to heal this, the symptoms of toxic stress that they're experiencing. So you can't take away community violence. You can't uh, you know, necessarily cure a person's uh, substance abuse. You can't get somebody out of prison, some of the yeah. problems you described. So, so what can you do then? So one of the things that we can do is number one, teach the parent or caregiver. Oftentimes, many caregivers have their own history of trauma that's being repeated. Particularly, we see this in you know, domestic violence or um, uh, having a parent with mental illness. And so helping the caregiver um, have resources and tools to be able to support their child. That's one thing that's really important. A second thing that we do is certainly mental health care, both for the child and for the caregiver. And then the other things that we do are some wellness activities um, that are evidence-based, things like biofeedback and breathing techniques that help people, even if they're in that difficult situation to be able to self-regulate and calm down. And then last question, what's the most important thing you'd like people to take away from hearing this? They might, you know, people might say, well, I don't live in that neighborhood or my family doesn't go through this. Why should we care? Well, you know, one of the most interesting things about the big uh, study done by Kaiser and the Centers for Disease Control was that that study population was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. And what they found was that uh, two thirds of the population had at least one adverse childhood experience and um, 12% of their patients had four or more. So this is something that affects us all. This isn't, certainly we see a higher dose in low income communities, but for every California, for every American, this is an issue. All right, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, thanks so much for your work and for coming in and telling us about it. Thank you.
That interview was previously recorded. Scott joins us now for a look at what's coming up on KQED News. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tui. So there's been a lot of concern about the drought, but now we're finally seeing a pretty big storm uh, predicted this weekend from Northern California and the Sierra. There's a temptation here to think that maybe we're out of the woods. That's not quite right, is it? It's not only not quite right, it's not even close to being right, unfortunately. Uh, despite all the precipitation that we're hoping for this weekend, uh, one top state water official this week said we could get significant precipitation every other day now through the end of May and still only get to normal. So wow. that gives you a sense of just how much of a deficit we have. So this is going to help. It does, you know, help a little bit, but uh, not nearly enough to, to get us, you know, out, out of any kind of uh, danger. So even if we're in that danger zone still, any amount of rain must help, doesn't it? It does, and that's, it could be frustrating to hear that, oh, this doesn't matter at all. It does. First of all, it helps with reducing the fire danger. Remember, we saw wildfires up north mm -hmm. and down near Los Angeles uh, last month. That will be tapped down. Uh, it also helps, of course, scrub the air. You know, you've got a lot of smog in places like the Central Valley, and the rain will help clean that up. That's great for kids, especially who have asthma. Uh, and it helps with the reservoirs to a certain extent. I mean, it's all good. It all helps, yeah. but I think it's, uh, you know, have to be careful not to think, well, we don't have to conserve water now or the farmers are going to get everything they need that they need because that's not the case at all. Right. Still keep your shower short and definitely conserve. Yeah. Last week we uh, mentioned this as well. The House of Representatives drought legislation in our piece on the San Joaquin River restoration. There was action on that this week. The House passed it. Um, but boy, a lot of criticism from Democratic lawmakers, Jerry Brown, even President Obama. What would this legislation do and why is there so much criticism? Well, what it would do is it would reallocate water from the the north to the farmers and it would end these river restoration programs you know the Republican Party which is of course controls the house is very close to agriculture and farmers they don't like the idea of uh, sending water away from farms into fish and to restoration and so uh, it's great politics for them it helps some of those vulnerable incumbents in the Central Valley Republicans who could be facing tougher races uh, but in terms of solving the problem not going to do anything and in fact it's dead on the water, so to speak, because mm -hmm. it's not going to pass the Senate. And as you said, President Obama criticized it, said he would veto it if it got to his desk. So Senator Feinstein says she's going to introduce something else soon that would help farmers without uh, without hurting fish and, and uh, rivers and all that. But we'll have to wait and see what it is. Yeah, definitely a lot of drought politics going on already. Absolutely. And there's more to come. OK, Scott, thank you. And for all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night and a great weekend.